can't remember who it was already this morning who mentioned that we need to focus not just about talking, but about doing. Lila Jana is a doer, and I'm going to ask her to start by telling you about what her organization does and where we're going to come around to our very quick sprint of a conversation, Lila, is how the people who represent the businesses in the room can do similar things. Sure. Uh, so uh, the organization I started, Samasource, is a, is a profitable nonprofit. So we are such an anomaly in Silicon Valley, I can't even tell you. <laughs> We're one of the few intentional nonprofits in the Bay Area. And we started eight years ago <laughs> to connect low income people to work through the internet. So I had read Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat. I had actually, actually worked as a management consultant for the outsourcing industry in India. And I thought, what if we could take this enormous industry, global outsourcing, and transform it so it could benefit people at the very bottom of the pyramid? What Mohammed, what Mohammed Yunus did for microfinance, I thought we could do for, for uh, outsourcing and create this new model of what we call micro work. So we started eight years ago breaking these big data projects down into small units of work. Uh, for example, we do image tagging for several of the machine, the biggest machine learning algorithms now in Silicon Valley. Uh, we, we have about 1,100 workers working full time doing this micro work from low income regions around the world. Break, and, uh, break that down sure. and, and go into detail briefly on, on those if you would. Who are the clients and where are the workers and are they your employees? Are they somebody else's employees? Sure, so um, we started off doing data entry work eight years ago, back before optical character recognition could do a lot of this in an automated way. Now we do uh, things like image tagging and content services for firms like Microsoft, Glassdoor, uh, TripAdvisor, um, IBM, we're actually talking to your team right now about doing this. And so, uh, so this is a, a really new type of work. Training the machines to do what humans used to do is an entirely new field. And as, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Jenny, this idea of augmented intelligence versus artificial intelligence requires a lot of human input. So we're training people who would otherwise be completely disconnected from the digital economy, people who previously made less than $2 a day in this new type of work. And it's a model we now call impact sourcing. And so um, you mentioned Microsoft. They pay Samasource? That's right. They pay Samasource, and we act as an agency that hires these workers directly. Now about 700 of the workers in our network are direct. We run a center in Kenya that employs them directly, and we also work through partners, so other organizations that have computer centers in low-income countries, typically nonprofits, that train people in these digital work skills. Take everyone, if you would, on a quick Cook's tour of where you are, because you're both in uh, the developing world and in the developed world, correct? That's right. We started a program in the U.S. a couple of years ago, uh, backed by the Robin Hood Foundation in, in New York. And we had this idea of training low-income Americans to do this kind of, of data services work, but also to benefit from the gig economy. So we were the first nonprofit to develop training tools for low-income people to benefit from platforms like Uber and Lyft and TaskRabbit and Care.com. And we're actually about to announce a partnership uh, with Care.com, something called the Care Institute we've been working on for several months to train low-income people to be caregivers on this new gig economy platform. It's kind of shocking to me that there are no federal or state-funded job training programs in the United States that focus on this rapidly growing sector of the gig economy. So you're, if I understand you correctly, uh, around the United States and around the world, um, people give care on an informal basis. They do it, but they don't participate in any sort of platform, and it's a reputational issue? That's right. One of, one of the main benefits, I think, of formalizing this informal work is giving people access to reputational equity. As white-collar workers, you get to benefit from a good job you did. You get a recommendation on LinkedIn. You get a whole employment history. If you're a day laborer, you go and you do great work for the day. The next day, you're zeroed out again. You stand on the street corner, and you have no ability to actually earn more money based on doing good work. So what we see in many of these platforms is that there's a very uh, quick ramp for workers to make more money faster if they're, if they're doing good work and, and actually benefit from the same reputational advantage that white-collar workers have had for, for many decades.